One of, one of the really, um, I think, interesting and important things ab about the, the symposium is the fact that we're going to jump essentially from topic to topic. So we've we've now uh, the last panel among other things, uh, remade the way we are going to teach architecture, um, as well as, of course, building buildings um, and, and at, at a very kind of deep uh, philosophical level. Uh, we're going to shift gears now um, to a, a topic that I think in some ways has been very visible and in some ways um, is only just now uh, getting, getting some important visibility, which, which is how is digitalization changing um, the ways, essentially, that houses, um, th that investments are made in housing. So we've been, Chris, Chris and I, as we, as we dug into this, we're really trying to think about uh, as you deploy things like AI and machine learning, um, is that changing the way investors uh, might behave and look at the sector? We, th we thought the answer was yes, but we were having uh, some trouble figuring out exactly who had figured out a deeper story about that. And then, of course, the related um, piece of that was, was the rise uh, of, of a variety of entities um, that were doing essentially eye-buying, so really kind of changing the, the fundamental real estate transaction. But fortunately, in, in the digging, um, we, we came upon a couple of, of terrific experts. I was, I was just reflecting that um, Desiree Fields, who's our um, first speaker, uh, is a name that I had not heard, and then in the course of one week popped up in two or three conversations uh, with people ab about this. And as soon as we looked at her material, uh, we were like, oh my goodness, we really need to have Desiree as, as part of this conversation. And somewhere in there, and I can't remember how, um, we came across uh, Mike, Mike Del Predi's work. Um, D Desiree teaches geography at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, Mike Del Predi is a scholar in residence at, at UC Boulder um, and also an industry consultant. And if you uh, are interested in this topic at all um, and you are not yet subscribing to Mike's uh, uh, newsletter, you should because it's just been fascinating to read. It was especially fascinating to read as, as Zillow's iBuyer business uh, blew up. Um, uh, late late last year, um, and and understanding what had happened. Um, so we're going to hear from from a, a presentation from Desiree. Unfortunately, um, Desiree can't join us uh, in person. But fortunately, thanks to the wonders of digitalization, she can join us uh, via Zoom, uh, and she will be part of the panel afterwards. Then we'll hear from Mike, um, and then um, we have two wonderful commentators. Um, Roberto Charvel, uh, who is both an investor uh, and, a, and, and like Mike, a sometime academic. Uh, Chris and I first met him when we were doing the first of, of our deep dives into in this innovation when he was at HBS. And um, uh, he is now teaching at Brandeis uh, just up the road. Um, will we'll comment, sort of giving us, I think, kind of a, a, an investor perspective. And then Robert Goodspeed, uh, who teaches planning uh, at the University of Michigan's Taubman College, uh, will uh, give us a little bit of the perspective from planning. Robert, among other things, has been uh, doing some interesting explorations in, in the field of, of, of uh, digital urbanism uh, or platform urbanism, um, which is, uh, I think, an important concept that I touched on uh, briefly. So without further ado, Desiree, it is all yours. And there she is. OK, great. Um, so you can go ahead and put up my slides. Thanks, Matt. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, David, for the introduction. Um, and thanks, big shout out to the logistics team uh, doing all the back end work to make it possible for me to participate remotely today. This is a really important conversation, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the panels um, with great interest. Um, and so my talk today is mostly an effort to make sense of a stymied research plan. So thanks for being here to process with me. Um, I'll be working through some newer ideas about market power that uh, this frustrated project has provoked. And I'll also be repeating some old ideas about how we can't discuss the potential for technology to address housing challenges without first situating technology in its wider political economic context. Nothing new, I'm sure, to this audience. Okay, whoops, let me go back one slide. 
Great. Okay. So part of the big picture of my paper is the reorganization of social relations that are associated with the rise of algorithms and digital platforms. As Jenna Burrell and Marianne Forcade argue, the use of computer code to sort, organize, extract, and mine massive data sets is often accompanied by promises of transparency and equal treatment, but has been documented to in fact raise significant concerns about fairness and equality and inequality. And meanwhile, algorithmic power can be opaque, difficult to challenge and to hold accountable. And as the work of Ruha Benjamin and others highlights, the digital era does not break with longstanding forms of racial capitalism. Instead, novel forms of predatory inclusion sit alongside longstanding forms of containment and exclusion. In today's housing market, digitization and these forms of racialized inequality clearly intersect. And to take just one example, recent research by Freddie Mac showed that automated appraisal algorithms were much more likely to overvalue homes owned by white borrowers. And this research is now the subject um, of a lawsuit against Wells Fargo. So the digitization of housing, of course, needs to be th thought through together with the ongoing role of property relations in the reproduction of inequality. And this is an idea I'll return to at the end of the talk. So these insights kind of form the background of how I understand the conjoined acceleration of tech and real estate during the pandemic. In the COVID-19 pandemic, both the tech and the real estate sector have surged. A flood of capital is chasing limited residential real estate investment opportunities. And society and, econ and the economy have grown more reliant on digital communication and commerce. And three interrelated trends demonstrate what I'm talking about here. The first is an expanded role for iBuyers. iBuyers use algorithms to rapidly price and make offers on homes, which they then flip to other buyers for a markup. Um, and if any of you are TikTokers or are deep into the iBuying conversation, um, you might be familiar with this uh, viral TikTok video by Sean Gotcher. Um, he's a real estate agent based in Arizona, um, and Zillow Offers was the unnamed subject of his viral video uh, last year, of course, before the demise of Zillow Offers. Um, the second trend is a major new wave of investment backing institutional scale landlords, also known as corporate landlords. Um, these actors also use algorithms to rapidly price and make offers on homes, but unlike iBuyers, corporate landlords buy homes to hold, renting them out to tenants. Um, and this has been documented in many, many articles um, in business media over the, fact of the past couple of years, um, including this article, um, which notes the growing participation of pension funds in the rental market. And the third trend is the proliferation of platform business models that offer either a path to home ownership through renting or provide non-professional investors, retail investors, exposure to the home rental market. Um, and so we can see this trend in um, the, the growth of sort of new funding streams for platforms, um, rent to own startups like Divi Homes, right? Which has garnered uh, new rounds of venture capital funding. So I'm trying to think through the market logics and power relations that give rise to such strategies. In essence, the question is, under what conditions do strategies like buying shares in a single family rental property become seen as thinkable, attractive, viable, necessary? And I draw on a few related influences to think about this question. The first is what I refer to as infrastructural theories of market power. And these help us think about uh, monopoly power in the era of financialization and digitization. This work attends to how the power to control market infrastructure and information, for example, as Amazon does with its online marketplace, how this power to control market infrastructure opens up new fields of business and enables powerful actors to shape information asymmetries to their material advantage. The second influence is work on the political economy of data. This scholarship highlights the simultaneous expansion and enclosure of digital data. What Marianne Forcade and Kieran Healy refer to as the information dragnet yields a profound amount of personal data, which is subject to the logic of accumulation and mobilized to extract value. In this way, rentier relations are foundational to what Keen Birch has termed techno-scientific capitalism. And the third body of work is theories of the performativity of markets which reject understanding markets as a naturally existing phenomenon. Instead, markets are seen as a practical reality brought into being as calculative devices like market forecasts, 
physical objects like tablets, joined together with the beliefs, expertise, and specialized knowledge of market actors, ranging from academic economists to consultants, traders, and quants. So drawing on these influences, my core argument is that the intersection of big capital and big tech have, has created a class of real estate market players who carry outsized power in the housing market, a shift that began in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis and has been considerably strengthened in the pandemic. And then, so now I'll expand on how the trends that I just laid out to you uh, um, kind of speak to these arguments. So first, the frustrated research project. Last summer, like many of you, I was following the expansion of iBuyers, which again, use algorithms to rapidly price and make offers on homes that they flip to other buyers. And I began to sketch out a project that would examine monopoly power in housing. My thinking was that Zillow could be understood as a platform monopoly. This is a term that we can associate with the work of uh, current FTC chair, Lena Khan. Um, so again, Zillow was already a behemoth of big data about real estate um, when it began its iBuying business. Um, so it had kind of many other lines of business before starting iBuying. It owns multiple other real estate listing platforms. It has been very active in acquiring real estate technology companies that offer tools to real estate and finance professionals. Um, and so Zillow's multi multifaceted presence in consumer and business facing operations really positioned the platform as a crucial form of infrastructure for today's increasingly digitized real estate market. Once it began its iBuying business then, Zillow occupied a dual role, both listing homes for sale as a marketplace operator and, complete, and competing against other merchants through buying and selling homes as a merchant in its own marketplace. A platform that sought to exploit this dual role could exploit information asymmetries to the detriment of its competitors. But before I knew it, Zillow announced last October that it would shut down its iBuying business. It had significantly overpaid for homes as it ramped up acquisitions in spring and summer 2021. There goes my research project, I thought. The demise of, of Zillow's iBuying arm could be interpreted as a sign of the limits of, of technology and the enduring role of local knowledge in housing markets. But I think this perspective misses the bigger picture of how Wall Street and Silicon Valley have transformed housing markets since the 2008 crisis. Zillow unloading some of its inventory in bulk sales to corporate landlords like Predium Partners really exemplifies this transformation, right? So with access to billions in capital and troves of data from their in-house operations, corporate landlords like Predium Partners are really positioned to structurally benefit from the downfall of smaller actors even when that smaller actor is in fact quite large and sitting on 18,000 homes like Zillow. So what we see in the demise of Zillow offers is, um, is less, less a kind of you know, a vindication of the role of local knowledge in real estate markets um, and more an opportunity to expand the Silicon Valley to Wall Street pipeline. Predium Partners, which controls more than 80,000 single family properties, is part of the group of large scale investors that exploited the 2008 crisis and the increased demand for rental housing that ensued due to the repossession of millions of homes, a process that was fundamentally racialized. Single family homes are of course a longstanding and meaningful part of the US rental housing sector. But as many of you are aware, there was little corporate presence in the single family rental market or SFR market before 2008. Ownership was highly deconcentrated. This was a very fragmented market. Operators controlling hundreds or thousands of properties was unheard of. But today, beyond the 80,000 plus rental homes controlled by Predium, three leading publicly listed single family rental operators, Invitation Homes, American Homes for Rent, and Tricon Residential, collectively control more than 150 single family, 150,000 single family homes. And these homes are primarily in the Sun Belt. So advances in technology coming to prominence since 2008 have really been the linchpin in this corporate consolidation of SFR. Innovations like cloud and mobile computing, digital platform architectures and business models, and massive data sets and the algorithms that sort them have made it possible for large investors to take advantage of the market dislocation caused by the 2008 crisis. 
These technologies enabled firms like Invitation Homes to monitor markets at scale, rapidly evaluate and submit offers on homes that meet their criteria, and efficiently manage large and geographically dispersed portfolios of single family homes. In fact, the most significant difference between corporate landlords and iBuyers is likely not in their acquisition algorithms, but in their value propositions, which are distinguished by holding versus flipping. Corporate landlords can make an all cash offer within hours of a property being listed. And these pre-acquisition efficiency gains reverberate throughout the rest of the investment life cycle. However, corporate landlords don't limit the use of technology to acquisition, right? They utilize tech and data science across all aspects of their operations, from acquisition to the optimization of rent pricing, to combing through applicant profiles with tenant screening software, to resident engagement, um, and of course, the process of evictions as well. And I'm happy to talk about all of this more in Q&A. But in general, due to their large portfolios and the data-driven management this scale of operation requires, the relationship between corporate landlords and tenants is one that is highly um, formalized and impersonal and opaque. So with their vertically integrated corporate structures and bespoke in-house platforms, institutional scale landlords have access to a continuous flow of data about tenants and operating costs with which they can seek out efficiencies and market opportunities. Unparalleled access to precision technologies, data and digital analytics underpins the institutionalization of single family rental and the market power of corporate landlords. Um, for the next few minutes, I'm going to be flipping back and forth between two slides. Um, so hopefully this works. Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how corporate landlords hold an advantage, not only in the context of a market dislocation like 2008, but also under conditions of a market boom. Today's major brands established their portfolios in a period of rapid growth from 2012 to 2014 by leveraging network digital technologies and the cheap debt made possible by post-2008 quantitative easing, and then even cheaper debt afforded by their securitization of rental income. Um, and they acquired foreclosed homes in Sunbelt metropolitan areas that were hit hard by the crisis. From 2015 to 2019, large players like Invitation Homes and Tricon American Homes got bigger, mainly by acquiring or merging with smaller players. As the industry grew and consolidated, it was also refining its data systems, acquisition algorithms, and its geographic and operational strategies. So when the pandemic sparked a surge of demand from investors rather than a housing downturn, corporate landlords were really poised to benefit. Since March 2020, more than 60 deals representing over $50 billion worth of investor and capital transactions have been announced in the single family rental sector. So it's spawning a new wave of investor led growth. The pandemic boom in single family rental has attracted substantial interest from state retirement systems for teachers and public employees. It has drawn new players like home builders and commercial real estate investors and financed build for rent as a new growth strategy amid rising prices for the constrained supply of existing homes. But private equity and alternative investment firms also remain central to the market. Blackstone, the investment giant that started Invitation Homes and then exited the company in 2019, has re-entered the market in a huge way. In 2020, it took a $240 million minority stake in rental company Tricon American Homes. And last year, Blackstone acquired rent-to-own company Home Partners of America for $6 billion. So existing large players like Invitation Homes, American Homes for Rent, and Tricon occupy a position of power in this market landscape. They began to assemble portfolios in a market downturn. They have already achieved economies of scale and the accompanying efficiencies. They possess a deep bench of data on which to base their strategies. And they have a track record of accessing the finance capital with which to execute these strategies. Coming from the world of finance rather than real estate, these powerful players have reorganized the, the logic by which the single family rental market operates. So what does the corporate consolidation of single family rental mean for everyone else? The industry is quick to note their relatively small share of the single family rental market roughly two to 3% currently. 
But the institutional transformation of SFR is not is playing out in just a handful of geographic markets across the Sun Belt, where corporate landlords are purchasing in segregated, mainly black and non-white Hispanic communities. Tenants of corporate landlords have faced aggressive rent increases and eviction filings um, and mounting fees as landlords seek out ways to squeeze as much revenue as possible from each home. Targeting a particular slice of the housing stock that essentially corresponds to what might otherwise be starter homes, corporate landlords are also crowding out would-be owner occupiers and at the same time evading local taxes and regulations and fighting tenant protections. And so in this way, we can see that corporate landlords shape market conditions far beyond the tenants renting from them. The structural power of corporate landlords is prompting the reconfiguration of accumulation processes by other market actors. We can observe this in the expansion of click to invest platforms backed by venture capital and private equity. The opportunities offered by click to invest platforms range from fractional shares of individual single family rental homes to ownership of specific already occupied rental properties to entire portfolios of homes. They also encompass earning passive income from shares of common stock in small portfolios. Platforms like Roofstock, Arrived Homes, Fundrise, and Intera.ai purport to harness data science, artificial intelligence, and proprietary data to empower retail investors. As Fundrise states, quote, we blend our investment expertise with smart technology to provide our investors with the buying power and investment opportunities traditionally reserved for billion dollar institutions. And as this demo of Roofstock One running on the side of the slide um, demonstrates, click to invest platforms also emphasize their ease of use, comparing the experience of real estate investment to online shopping. Along with the growth of click to invest platforms, we're we are witnessing a resurgence of rent to own schemes. As more would be homeowners are shut out of the hot housing market, rent to own business models backed by Silicon Valley and Wall Street purport to offer a path to home ownership. The increasingly tight housing supply and rapid home price appreciation seen during the pandemic enhanced the appeal of rent to own schemes but the uh, findings about the success of these schemes are, is pretty mixed, right? Most tenants, in fact, do not go on to purchase the homes that they lease, and evictions are not uncommon. Rather than a democratization of housing, the uptick in rent-to-own companies may be a sign of the further consolidation of corporate control over housing. As with click-to-invest platforms, as with corporate landlords, the underlying model of rent-to-own schemes de depends on acquiring and renting out single-family homes. So considering all of the trends that I've discussed today, um, this talk has considered how market actors have reframed single-family homes as a, as a site of novel investment strategies, first in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis and now um, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So while ownership of single-family homes remains a key source of wealth, it is a host of new players beyond owner-occupiers who are involved in grabbing value. The combination of technology, finance capital, and rentier relations mobilized by corporate landlords has changed the logic of the market for single family homes, such that market opportunities are now gauged in relation to these institutional players. Even massive missteps like the one that the, the missteps that Zillow made become strategic for corporate landlords. So the weight that corporate landlords have in the have in the housing market helps us to understand the growth of venture capital and private equity backed business models that draw participants into the rental market as either investors or eventual homeowners. While nominally democratizing real estate investment, such platforms accelerate the process of commodification that creates a discursive opening for them in the first place, ultimately contributing to the very conditions that they purport to ameliorate. Moreover, acquisitions by corporate landlords, click to invest platforms and rent to own platforms are particularly focused on racially segregated areas where most residents are non-white. Such inclusion in a restructured real estate market stands to deepen racialized inequalities in wealth and housing stability in order to fuel accumulation by distant, 
often atomized landlords. Finally, we must consider the rhetoric of transparency often associated with algorithms against the reality that such transparency often operates only in one direction, consolidating the power to know. Novel tech-powered investment strategies in the single family market rely on corporate ownership structures that allow individual entities to own parcels under many unique names. And you can see on the slide um, a sampling of LLC names used by imitation homes in Charlotte, North Carolina. So if we are to hold algorithmic power to account, one place to start is by socializing the power to know. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion to come. Thank you, Desiree. And um, Mike, you're, you're on. Matt, are we ready to go? Good. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Mike Del Preti. Uh, so my, my focus is on emerging models in real estate. And what that means for me is new models that are looking to change the way people buy and sell houses. So I want to start today with one of my favorite quotes from Richard Branson. Uh, if you want to be a millionaire, start with a billion dollars and launch a new airline. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, and if I were to adjust this for my realm of focus in real estate, it would be, if you want to be a millionaire, start with a billion dollars and launch a real estate tech company. All right, so what I want to do is tell a story today of these emerging models, but do it in the context of a how-to. All right, I'm going to teach you how to lose a billion dollars in real estate tech. All right, so there's a lot of different ways to lose a billion. Uh, the first one is to start an iBuyer. So Desiree already had the hard job of explaining what that is, but you know, fundamentally, iBuyers are companies that buy homes very, very quickly from consumers, flip them, um, kind of new, new coat of paint, new carpets. You know, within two weeks, they relist them again, sell them uh, on the open market. The largest iBuyer is a company called Open Door. So iBuyers have been gaining market share really exponentially over the past couple of years. Um, in 2021, iBuyers had 1.3% market share. That's about 70,000 homes that they purchased in the US. Um, that's up a lot from 2020, but 2020 was a weird year, so we're just gonna ignore that and go back to 2019. It's double 2019. That number in 2019, you don't see it here, it was double than 2018. That was double 2017. So real estate is a notoriously slow-moving industry, this is moving fast. You know, I'm going to pay attention to anything that's doubling year after year after year. So iBuyers are getting to be quite a big scale. And as Desiree mentioned, this is national. The iBuyers are not national. They're very much concentrated in two dozen markets, primarily in the Sun Belt. So Opendoor, the largest iBuyer out there, they've raised over $1.3 billion since their founding. They went public um, in 2020. And so they have access to a lot more capital. They've raised $1.3 billion. Um, they've also managed to lose $1.6 billion. So that's not spent, that's lose, all right? So they've lost $1.6 billion. Um, Zillow, Zillow lost $1.5 billion in just three short years in its iBuying business, which is called Zillow Offers. $1.5 billion they've lost. And you, you see you know, in this chart and the one before it, those losses are getting bigger. They're not getting smaller. So you have two behemoths of real estate tech, Open Door and Zillow. Collectively, they've lost over $3 billion. If you're paying attention, you're probably asking why. What, what are they up to? Like, why are they willing to lose that much money? And hopefully, we'll get there over the next kind of 15, 20 minutes here. But I want to introduce a sentence. So anyway, when I was teaching my class once, I asked my students the same thing. I'm like, why, why would this do this? And um, you know, kid in the back raised his hand tentatively, said, yeah, what do you think? He said, he said this, and I've been using it in my presentation since then. It's not about the house, it's about the transaction. All right, so this is the theme we're gonna return to. What's another way to lose a billion dollars in real estate tech? Well, you could launch a tech-enabled brokerage. So what I'm talking about there is uh, very specifically a company called Compass. Compass is a real estate tech brokerage, um, tech-enabled, founded out of New York City, now they're national. What, what sets Compass apart from a lot of other businesses in this space, you know, traditional brokerages like Coldwell Banker, Sotheby's, um, 
is that it's raised a massive amount of venture capital. So Compass has raised over one and a half billion dollars since its founding, over a billion from SoftBank. You know, it was kind of the big backer behind WeWork and some of these other, uh, Katera, some of these other businesses we're talking about. And you see this huge pivot point here in kind of 2017. And it's been going really well for them. So in terms of transaction volumes, I mean, look at that. That's growing. This is a very slow moving industry, U US real estate, but that's been kind of doubling year after year after year. Revenue's up to six and a half billion dollars. They've got 26,000 agents. Uh, uh, in 2021, Compass is now the largest brokerage in the United States in terms of transaction volume, um, dollar volume. So not number of units, not number of houses, but the total value of all of those houses. That's huge, right? That's great. Uh, it turns out the way that they're operating is incredibly unprofitable. So Compass, they've raised one and a half billion. They've also lost one and a half billion dollars. So they're, they're managing to lose lots and lots of money in this model. Um, and, and one of the, the keys to their model is taking that money and acquiring agents. So that can be on an individual basis, like, hey, all of you, why don't you, why don't you come work for me? I'll give you each a signing bonus of 50 grand, 100 grand, right? All the top producers in an area. Or I might just go out and buy entire brokerages, right? I have all of this money. What can I do with it? I'm going to acquire market share. So Compass is effectively turning money into market share and turning that market share into market power, which is something I'll return to at the end. All right, the, the third way to lose a billion, and these, these are not the only three, but these are the only three I'm talking about today, is launch a company called a power buyer. All right, so um, this is my kind of thought framework here. If you think about iBuyers being close to the transaction and focused on sellers, right? If you wanna sell your home, you can either go the traditional way you know, I gotta, I gotta find a real estate agent, I gotta figure out what my home is worth, I gotta clean it up, fix that, paint that, mow that, get the kids out, keep it clean, get rid of the dog smell. I can replace all of that with an instant sale to an iBuyer, right? So the focus is on sellers and reducing the friction and making it fast, all right? So that's where, um, that's where iBuyers are. Power buyers are over here, right? Same thing, they're very close to the transaction, uh, but they're focused on buyers. So if you think, yeah, somebody told me once, right? Nobody ever gets excited about selling their home. They get excited about buying a home. Makes a lot of sense to be in this quadrant. So power buyers have a, a they have two products. Um, one is, we'll turn your offer for a home into a cash offer. Because in a, in a high demand, low supply market, you need to stand out from the crowd. If you wanna buy a home, it needs to be a cash offer. If you wanna compete against institutional landlords, like invitation homes, going out there and offering cash, you need to be able to offer cash too. You cannot have a contingent offer. So that's one thing they do. The other thing they do is this idea of buy before you sell. Right, move into, these are three screenshots taken from three different power buyers. Right, buy before you sell. Buy your dream home with our money, move into it, pay some rent, and then we'll sell your old home. And once we've sold it, we'll kind of settle up at the end of the day, right? Just trust us, everything will kind of, everything will kind of work out. Um, it's a really interesting model, and if, you know, if I owned a home, I think I would look to something, something like this. Uh, as you can imagine, that model's really popular the past couple of years in the real estate market we're in, high demand, low supply. Uh, one power buyer, Orchard, uh, they've tripled their volume in 2021. They're looking to probably double or triple again. All of these companies have, have done this. So again, slow moving industry, these companies are moving really fast. Collectively, the top three or four companies have probably raised over a billion dollars and they've spent it, they're growing. Um, but one of the beauties of these models here is again, it's not about the house, it's about the transaction. So they sell your old home, so they tap into brokerage. Uh, they're pre-approving you, you're using their money. That sounds a lot like financing, bridge loan, right? Uh, these companies are getting industry high mortgage attach rates of 70%. So 70% of their customers end up using their mortgage, right? So I'm, if I'm he helping David move into a new house, use my money, go, go ahead, go in there, chances are David's gonna use my mortgage and that's where, they, that's where I can make money, right? It's really interesting. So what do these, these three kind of models all have in common? It's money. You know, it's kind of like if I, if I went to you and said, hey, if I gave you a billion dollars and said, do something in real estate, what would you do? Like, what could you do with that money, right? We're using money to solve problems. 
iBuyers are using money to buy the damn house from people. Like, they're just buying houses. Compass is using money to acquire market share. The power buyers are using money to get you into your new house while they sell your old one, right? And, and throughout all of this, in, in the world of these businesses, there's a new competitive advantage, right? It's not low cost production or easy access to customers. It's this new competitive advantage of sustained unprofitability. They don't need to make money. They can lose money year after year after year. We were, earlier today, we were talking about Zillow. You know, Zillow launched 2004, 2005. Zillow's been unprofitable since day one. It's never made a profit until the pandemic. People don't realize that. Redfin never made a profit. All of these big real estate tech companies, these household names are unprofitable. You can be unprofitable for a decade, two decades. So what's driving all this? How is this, how is this actually possible? Um, it's coming in from venture capital investment. So in the US, if you're looking at real estate tech, that VC investment, venture capital investment, since 2015, over $30 billion. Our investor, investors are pouring billions into this space, effectively subsidizing new business models. And then in last year, look at that, 20 billion. It was 30 billion up to it, and then another 20 billion for good measure in 2021. It's crazy, it's just a huge amount of money. And what these venture capitalists are doing is they're, they're, they're subsidizing new models to change how people buy and sell and everything in the whole real estate ecosystem. Here's a great, you know, these are just some of the companies that have raised a lot of money and are reinventing parts of the space, parts of the transaction. What I've been focusing on is this, right? This is how to find a home, buy a home, sell a home. You have tech-enabled brokers, alternative financing, selling your home. This is just part of it, right? So how do these companies make money? Because they're, they're raising a lot, and they're spending a lot, and they're losing a lot. But how do they, how do they make money? Um, a lot of the big companies that, that I follow, you know, these, these kind of the tech-enabled brokers and power buyers, iBuyers, Fundamentally and, and historically, it all comes down to commissions. Like there's not a lot of ways to make money in real estate. Fundamentally, you have a brokerage commission, right? An agent commission, when you sell your home, you pay that kind of five and a half, six percent to a real estate agent. And then mortgage. If you're originating a loan, originating a mortgage, you make money, you get a commission off that. It all comes down to commissions. And who pays commissions? We do, people do. So what are the implications about all this? And I, I love that Desiree was talking about market power because that's kind of how I decided to, to, to land this whole presentation as well. There, there are a lot of questions around market power. So Compass, um, in their crazy acquisition, right? A billion and a half dollars, we're gonna get big and big and big. They're growing market share. In San Francisco, they had about 35% share of the market in San Fran. Um, and look where everyone else is, I mean, that's that's, multiple times greater than any other company there. What's interesting, and as I mentioned before, they're turning that market share into market power. So one way they're doing that is through exclusive listings, exclusive content. They are selling houses that you can only see on Compass, right? They have private exclusives. Actually, they, this guy in LinkedIn posted this, he's since blocked me, but he said, this is a Compass agent, right? I have inventory on our private Compass platform that will never get listed on Zillow or Redfin. That reminds me a lot about um, uh, Netflix and Apple TV, right? It's the same thing. It's exclusive content. Apple TV is, is spending money and Netflix is spending money to create content just on their platform to get consumers there. This is fragmentation. This is causing fragmentation in the industry. We're going from one system of MLSs where basically everybody can see access to what's there to the compass system in this instance where the only way to get it is to call them. Think about where the power is in that. The power feels like it's moving away from me as a consumer and it's moving towards a company, a for-profit company funded by Wall Street, losing lots of money. Like what do we know about Wall Street companies that are losing a lot of money? They need to figure out how to make money. All right, so that's the situation we have right here. All right, let's go back to this, um, this. It's not about the house, it's about the transaction. What does that actually mean? Um, Zillow's new plan, right, once Zillow offers blew up last year, is kind of Zillow 3.0, right? They're building a housing super app. This to me looks very ecosystemy, right? This is what happens in a transaction. Uh, they, wanna, they wanna be part of that, they wanna control it, they wanna make money from a lot of parts of it, right? This is, how they're, this is their plan, this is how we're making money. We're getting involved in the transaction. 
if we think about um, Open Door, the largest iBuyer, they have a mortgage operation. And what Open Door has been doing for last year and this year is they're giving people a 2% rebate on a home when you finance with Open Door home loans. That's a lot of money, 2%. Like that's a lot, that's a lot of money. They're, they're effectively paying consumers to use their product. And, what we're, and there's more examples of this, but what we're seeing is this idea of bundle and save, right? If I'm a company, use more and more of my products and services and you'll save money. That's less choice, but it's more savings. So as a consumer, you gotta, you gotta think about that. How important is that for you? Do you want choice? Do you want savings? What does the intersection of that look like? So what's happening right now in the market, so this is, this is data that I was working on, I don't even know what today is, this week, last week, really soon, um, really recently. What's going on in the market, Open Door is buying and selling homes. They are buying homes, and then when they list them for sale, they're listing them for 17% more than they bought them for about a month earlier, all right? That is $60,000. So I'm going to say that again, just so it kind of sinks in. Open door, this iBuyer, they're buying homes. They're buying single family homes. And about a month later, they're listing them for sale for $60,000 more than they bought them for. That's what's happening right now. Open door is not a bad company. They're not evil. They're not trying to like bring about the downfall of the American housing system. This is simply representative of the market. The market is crazy right now. Home price appreciation is through the roof. I had to change the, um, the x-axis on this graph because it's getting so big, all right? So th this is, like, it's very easy to blame people, right? Where uh, Americans love to be outraged about things and this is an easy thing to get outraged about. Um, but this is representative of the market. And, and by the way, the same thing is where Zillow went wrong. So last year, you get Open Door and Zillow. Zillow was losing money on half the houses they bought. So that before March 2020, Home price appreciation was kind of like a flat line. It's very easily predictable. After March 2020, it, it's literally going like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. It was too much for Zillow. They made some bad bets, and they ended up losing hundreds of millions of dollars by overpaying for homes. Open Door, on the other hand, was able to still make money, which if you think about AI and algorithms and operational excellence within a company, uh, not, you know, they're not all created equal. Open Door succeeded where Zillow failed. Open Door's algorithms were better. Open Door's operational ability to ride this is better. So one thing that these companies are doing, iBuyers, again, this is happening right now, they're selling some of their homes directly to investors. So in 2021, iBuyers, right, they, they acquired 70,000 homes. They sold about 20% of their inventory directly to investors. Again, let's skip 2020, but think about, look at 2019, that's more than double, right? It's actually, in terms of the number of houses, the number, it's 2,000 to 8,000, and almost, almost quadrupled since 2019. A lot of these houses never come back on the market. Open Door is buying them from people, they're fixing them up, and they're turning around and selling them to Predium Partners, Invitation Homes, American Homes for Rent. It's good business, right? If they can avoid listing it on the market, they save paying agent fees and all this other nonsense. These, these percentages are generally in line with what's happening in the market. Generally, if you look at big markets like Phoenix and Atlanta, about 20% of the inventory is being sold to investors. So again, these are not the cause of what's going on, but it is a reflection and it's something we gotta think about, right? Are we okay with this? These companies are, are sucking up inventory from folks like you and me and then they, a Wall Street funded for-profit company is deciding who to sell them to. Do I wanna put it back on the market or do I wanna just sell it to my buddy at Invitation Homes for Rent? Or Invitation Homes or American Homes for Rent? So when I, when I think about all this and kind of the closing thoughts I, I, I wanna leave you with, first off, you know, with great market power comes great responsibility. There's a lot at stake here. Um, what I see when I, when I kind of listen to myself and, and what I'm talking about is that we're moving from this open ecosystem to a series of walled gardens, 
right? You gotta call the compass agent to see what's for sale in San Francisco. Maybe I'm missing something. Or, well, I'm with Open Door, I'll use their mortgage product. So if I stay in the Open Door ecosystem or the Zillow ecosystem, I can save money, but I'm, I'm kind of with them. We, we have all these, all these walled gardens. Everybody in this space has an ecosystem play. This is what it is. And what's, what's been beautiful about real estate is it's been pretty open. You know, love them or hate them, real estate agents and MLSs, like it, it is generally open and I'd say pro-consumer. But what we have now is we have these for-profit for businesses funded with billions of dollars of Wall Street capital. They're getting intimately involved in the residential real estate transaction. And the key words there are intimately and transaction. They're actually buying houses and they're selling houses. They're, they're going into the house, doing things, and then selling it. That's never happened at this scale before. And I think what we're finding out is what's good for the company isn't always aligned with what's good for the consumer. And that's, that's the question, right? That's, that's the topic. That's what, what I believe we should be talking about. Um, and there's so much momentum right now that that is why it's more important now than ever before to pay attention to this. And I think this is definitely a worthwhile conversation to have. Thank you. Uh, and Desiree. Let's just grab my notes here for a second. The last panel, by the way, set a really high bar for the quality of conversation. I don't want to put any pressure on you. But, um, uh, Robert, why don't you um, kick us off? What, what, what has struck you? What, what, Sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I prepared some brief remarks. One is, um, uh, who am I? I'm an urban planner, and I mainly teach professional master students who are going to go off and work for cities, work for consulting firms. So I'm not an expert in real estate, so kind of why am I here? And then I'll give you a quick argument that I think kind of my take on the headwinds facing the platform firms we've just been hearing about, about that arise out of the, the nature of housing. And then I'll leave you with a couple of questions, like on my mind, I think will relate to topics that are coming up later. So first, when you think about housing, you know, I think it relies on systems of um, property rights, zoning, building codes, licensing all the professionals. Um, uh, the state is deeply implicated in all those, this, the, the, the securitization. And so what field is the expert in all that kind of stuff? Well, planning's one of them, law's another. And so like, I would definitely second, I think, uh, the uh, idea that um, came out of the last panel that academic uh, architectural research has to engage more deeply on, on all of those. And as I was kind of reflecting on that, I'm like, why is Sweden and Japan so innovative? Well, they're better governed societies that have m much uh, higher higher tax rates and without going into details, kind of takes resources to innovate um, on all of those sides. And so our society has its strengths and, and weaknesses. Um, so anyway, that, so I think you know, planning has expertise on all of those and kind of it needs to be a partner um, here. And so uh, here's my argument about the two papers um, that the, the uh, uh, um, well, one other thought before we get there is my lens about digital tech and like what impact it'll have. The starting point is the whole debate about digital technology and government in the 90s. And um, there was a hope that it would be transformative. Um, but I think the experience was often it automated the same old paper-based inefficient systems. And it's been a long slog to get towards more transformative alternative ways of doing business. I think the same dynamics play on the private sector. And the most dramatic version of that is the rise of platform firms which are using digitally mediated transactions to have fundamentally new business models. And that's kind of what where we arrive at, at today. So, so um, you know, I think it's being disrupted in the sense of the market's being entered by new firms backed by VC, um, but it's been, the overall effect has been less than other sectors um, due um, to the unique nature of housing as a commodity and the lack of state innovation. And so we've, so the two papers kind of illustrated this, um, and you know, the, the, and Mike had a, a piece I read, the demise of iBuying, I mean, agents are just being disrupted by other agents, not by like a robot, and um, Desiree points you know, her automated landlord is just dis dis disrupting the slumlord down the street. 
And so I think if you think about it, housing is not a kind of normal good. It's highly differentiated. Every home has its own history. A home on one side of the street's in a flood zone, the other one isn't. Two built identically, one has had the asbestos siding removed, the other has not, and so forth. And all of those attributes that relate to value are, you know, um, uh, David earlier made the claim there's, you know, that what's on Zillow is amazing, but I just bought a house and I had to pay for a lot of inspections because what, what I wanted to know was not on Zillow. And if I were to you know, want to do uh, very rigorous data training for valuation, um, there's a lot of variables that we don't have digitally. So, so that's kind of my view uh, about kind of what's going to challenge the, uh, the platform play in the real estate space. Um, and then Mike, in another article he didn't touch on today, pointed out there's some psychological issues here. Um, instantaneous this is his words, real estate transactions are a solution in search of a problem, which I liked, and uh, kind of questioning uh, disruptive innovation has to have a value proposition that a, that a market wants, and you can't just assume it, it has to be validated. And so I thought that was a very insightful uh, point. Uh, but anyway, as I, as I kind of mentioned, I'm not a, a, a real estate expert. You know, in my view, I think about how my students analyze mortgage lending in Detroit. At the track level in any given year, there could be a number of loans in the single digits. And so in planning, we're concerned with places that are, um, you know, sometimes completely ignored or neg neglected by the commercial industry. And we're the ones over there crafting the ugly deals with subsidies to kind of make something happen um, or are looking at kind of alternative economic uh, models. And, uh, and so, you know, kind of where does this leave me or, you know, where I'll, I'll throw out there. One is I think absolutely we need empirical evidence of the effects of these trends. We're going to hear some about mortgage lending. Desiree made comments about evictions, which I've seen in my work and how structural changes in the market affects eviction rates by different community, by race. Um, and so forth. Um, and I'm not, I never assume we're going to move in the right, right direction and kind of to relate to the ethical conversation, you know, firms need internal and social ethical frameworks and that regulatory innovation. Um, the second point is like where I'm much more interested is what are alternative models that exist um, that gonna, are going to foster housing goals of sustainability, fair housing, racial equity, um, you know, crowdfunding not in the investor f form but in more community based um, models equity crowdfunding is kind of interesting there's this thing nightingale housing in australia where uh, a, a group of people with an architect do a participatory design process for a whole building they're all going to live in you use cross subsidies between units to achieve social diversity and affordability so it's you know kind of co-housing uh, models and so forth um, and then you know the, the final one is kind of my lens would be like how do we bring a spatial perspective um, you know i think a lot of the investments in the sun belt because they're just trying to search for homogenous markets of housing because it avoids those structural problems I point out. Well, the, North, the Rust Belt in the Northeast is like a pretty large region where I live and on all those maps there's like not much action there. So kind of what are the models that are going to um, serve us? Maybe I'm glad they're not coming or like I'm worried like maybe they eventually will get enough data to come and I want to be ready to regulate them or whatever it's going to take to um, to make sure there's not pernicious kind of outcomes. And and so even within metros, we have you know, super Super racially and economically segregated metros, like when you know mortgage lending is just one. It's just so stark, and I'm like, I'm always worried or wonder, like, um, does the increased intelligence on the targeting and the marketing of all these products, like, how do we ensure it's not just hardening those boundaries and um, allowing for you know. Um, uh, uh, negative spatial targeting um, is just going to make worse these patterns of segregation that are causing so many so many issues. So, anyway, there's a little bit of a, a planner's flavor for you, and thanks for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, R Roberto. You've you've got the the weight now of of, of speaking for and and I guess perhaps defending. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the real estate uh, investor community. Yes, um, I feel a little bit like a fish outside the water because of that. Um, the last two interventions have been a little bit against venture capital, and I'm representing the bad guys. So I hope I don't get kicked out into the rain today. Um, I st after working for, in private equity for real estate for several years, I was invited to teach at Harvard Business School. I was teaching the real estate class. And when I was there, I was lucky enough to meet David um, Chris, Steve Wakel from, uh, from MIT, the, the, the real estate initiative that they have down there, and also Andrew Baum from Oxford and so many other people. And I realized there was this thing called PropTech. 
And um, I was fascinated. And that's when I decided to say, OK, it's f time for me to go back to work and make some money from, from this new trend. But I, I've noticed so many different things. One of them was that when I was sh started teaching at Harvard, I was writing cases on interesting companies that were doing a lot of innovation. We were talking about modular earlier on. And I was writing a, 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 a study about a company from the Netherlands called uh, Citizen M. It's a hotel they have here, one in Boston and some other places. And it's amazing. The rooms are modular, and they build them in, in Poland. And they include even the television that's going to be on your room. It comes from everything is set up. It's incredible. I also was writing one of the first cases on uh, um, the first venture capital firm focused on PropTech called Fifth Wall that uh, was mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, Harvard Business School was not that excited about these cases because they were technology innovation. They were not finance. The finance class at, at real estate on the other side of the river is part of the, sorry, the real estate class is part of the finance department. Why is that? Because a lot of the innovation into the real estate cycle had come from Wall Street. Uh, Mortgage-backed security, securitization, all these things had, that was a cool thing to do. Like a lot of the students from Harvard Business School moved to Wall Street and they were the ones that were doing all innovations on the business cycle and the real estate. So that's where I kind of realized that there was something missing or maybe prop tech should be outside and I decided to go back to investing. Um, and when I started reading and learning more about the space, I realized that, for example, one of the first things that I wanted to learn was, what's happening? Is there something happening with materials? And it's been 20 years, and really, graphene hasn't really taken off, unfortunately. The next thing that I started to, to read was uh, uh, from my ex-colleagues at McKinsey. I also read the analysis that Ivan mentioned about how productivity had decreased in construction. So OK, let's, so the closer you get into construction, the better, the better returns you will have. You're able to systematize and, and build digitalization into that space. And it was one of the sad things about that paper says that really the market is not in a great spot because a lot of the, the real estate companies are prone to uh, re, um, economic cycles and they go bankrupt. So they're not investing enough in um, doing innovation in real estate construction. And um, well, Wall Street, maybe the real estate uh, companies are not doing that, but now venture capital is coming along. I was very sad to see that Katera didn't do well, but, but I'm happy to see that there's other companies. When we started talking about these, these topics, uh, David and I, many years ago, we were so excited about Katera. And suddenly it exploded. And in his paper, David mentions that, well, yeah, it's like a, Unfortunately, Qatar is gone, whatever, but there's other companies. And not because this one failed, this means that there's no space for profiting and making things better. Um, I think that Qatar had a lot of management problems rather, rather than like a real focus on how to solve the problem that they were trying to tap into. And thank God there's other, other players in the space. Uh, and then the next thing, you talk about materials, then you think about construction. The, big, the biggest thing is uh, what the panel is about, how to buy and rent homes. So I started studying Craigslist and then Zillow and then Redfin. And if you think about how it's also very well um, mentioned, it's very well defined in your paper where you say Zillow was trying to dis uh, take, make, t uh, get rid of the broker, but then decided to sell things to the broker, the sell information. Redfin came along and said, well, I don't want to help other brokers. I'll create my own brokers. And that was kind of interesting. When I was super excited, it was the beginning of Compass. Compass was not buying brokers. The idea of Compass was to enable any broker, anyone, open, give them the best technology so that they could become more profitable. Unfortunately, they raised so much money that they didn't know what to do with it. So they started buying brokers. And then they created this now broker, um, huge broker, and very focused on high-end markets and all, all the story that Mike was able to tell, tell us about. But more and more, um, we think about how these things are starting to change the relationship with brokers and, and to do things in a different way. And then came along Open Door. OK, the, 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 the broker killer. Um, with this idea of like, I'm going to do I buying and I'm going to get rid of brokers altogether. Well, brokers are still alive and some of them uh, will continue to do great. Like in the document, in one of the documents, it says that um, technology doesn't sell homes, brokers sell homes. People, are, uh, people still need to have this help of someone to avoid any kind of potential risk on the way they buy and sell homes. But the reason I'm talking about all of these things is that um, we, we come to a point where we see technology as the bad guys. 
Uh, this year we're saying, uh, mentioned the, the single um, uh, rental homes and she talked a lot about the companies and how there's a bridge between Silicon Valley and Wall Street and the bad guys. If you think about the program of single homes, it was started by the Obama administration. They were trying to buy houses out of the banks that were sitting vacant in a lot of the parts of the, of the, of the country. And they were trying to provide rentals to them. It took so long for the government to, to step in that eventually the, the um, Blackstone and other people were able to find this an, uh, as an opportunity. I would really like to hear about um, not only the negative things about this, but also there's some positive things. I think Desiree probably has more information and is probably um, is able to show this in a different way, but uh, people now in some areas, instead of needing to buy, they can rent a house, and they can rent a house with a better service maybe sometimes. And um, maybe the house doesn't have asbestos because if it has a problem, you can sue the big company that is, uh, has to clean the house. There's also good things. I would just like to finish my, my, my couple of minutes that I had, to, had here on the panel to say one thing. I have never met an entrepreneur that says, I want to make money the first day. They always are thinking about ways of doing things in a different way, ways of decreasing transactional risks, ways of uh, changing the way we think about something in the world. So it's not, it's not only the venture capital entrepreneurship is not the bad people, it's the problems that they, a lot of the unforeseen risks that, that, that you run into. And I'm gonna finish with this idea. When Uber started, I think we were all fascinated with how people didn't re in the future were not going to need to buy a car. You could just like Uber here, oh, um, you basically now, now need the service of transportation rather than buying a car. Then it moved to Airbnb, and I think we all were, I was fascinated to see that maybe some of the real estate assets that were not necessarily used to capacity were now going to be able to use, be used to capacity to be rented to, to other people, and I was fascinated. But then it came that it started pushing people out of their neighborhoods, and people could not rent or buy these homes, and neighborhoods started to struggle. So I don't think it's technology in itself that's a problem. I think if we go back to the first point, it's regulation. We don't have enough, and not regulation in a bad way. I, say, I, I, I mean regulation in a good way, not against technology, but about we don't have enough housing built in this country. That, is, that goes back to the point. It's not about how we change and we think about decreasing the frictions of how we do things. It's about how quickly we can move to develop new homes. Just to finish, the guys from Cities and M when they were building their, build, their, new, their new hotels in New York, they had to fly the people from regulatory, the, the, the people that were accepting the projects, they had to fly them to Poland to see if they, they complied with, a, with regulations with the U.S. I mean, how complicated is that? It shouldn't be the case. It should be the easiest thing in the way. So we should go back to the regulatory, but the, but the original regulatory issues, which is let's build more homes in this country. Thank you. We've, we've you got, don't seem like a bad got, guy. We've got, got, got some great <laughs> stuff on the table. And, and it seems to me... Uh, um, Desiree and, 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 then, and then Mike, there, there were two really, I, I want to pull two questions out, but also give you the opportunity to respond to anything else you heard. And, and, and one, I, I think it's a, a marvelous question about is there, wh what are the upsides of, of the changes we've been seeing? Um, and I guess the question is upsides also for whom? Um, and, and, the, and the related question, uh, which I was going to tee up if, if you hadn't, which was given the changes that you're seeing, um, what would what, what what do you see as potential policy responses to, to mitigate some of some of the negative downsides? As I say, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on both of those, but also giving you a chance to respond to uh, you know two very uh, two two very thoughtful commentaries. Um, Desiree, why don't we start with you? Sure, happy to. Um, so I'll take the second question first, if that's all right. Um, so, and I'll focus primarily on corporate landlords um, because that's the primary focus of my of my work. Um, so, in terms of the kinds of policy changes that we should be seeking out in order to kind of better manage the um, the negative consequences of corporate landlords, I think there are um, three things that we could do from a regulatory perspective, and and probably some of these things will happen at different scales, right? Some will happen at the local scale, some should be national. Um, I think the first thing is to foster greater transparency of property ownership and rental practices. So that last point that I ended on, 
the ways in which um, LLCs and other corporate ownership structures really kind of shield um, property owners from public scrutiny and responsibility, and also, of course, from independent research, um, is a is a problem because we simply, you know, we have kind of lost the power to know um, what is going on in real estate markets in any kind of um, accessible way, right? So I think um, things like um, Greater transparency of beneficial owners would be would be huge. Rental registries, both of these things probably happening at the local or state level, right? But a combination of insight into beneficial owners and um, rental registries, I think, would really help researchers and policymakers to better understand the business practices of property owners um, and be able to respond appropriately. So I think this kind of transparency is a is a necessary, but probably not sufficient policy goal, right? I think the the second step would be to implement very broad-based tenant protections. Um, corporate interests are drawn to rental housing um, and single family rental in particular because um, of the profit to be made, not only from rent increases, but also things like ancillary fees, fines, et cetera. Um, and, um, and tenant protections are, um, are uh, abysmal, I would say, in the U.S. Right? Um, so, and you know, even in places that do have rent control, single-family homes um, are usually uh, not included in those protections. So, I think, um, you know, while a lot of the conversation about corporate landlords, you know, focuses on, you know, what can we do about, um, you know like single family homes in particular or tenants of corporate landlords, I think um, implementing broad-based tenant protections that protect all tenants, um, help them control their housing costs and offer more security of tenure, um, I think would would uh, obviously protect all tenants, but also make a dent in the kind of the business model of, of corporate landlords, right? And then I think the third step um, is that we should consider limiting the market share of corporate landlords um, within individual metropolitan scale markets um, in order to foster a healthier mix of ownership and tenure. Um, so I think those are some of the kind of the regulatory steps um, that we could take that might help um, limit some of the, the kind of the more aggressive rent increases, eviction practices, and so forth, and kind of um, generally allow, you know, allow institutional players to participate in the rental market, um, but, you know, not in ways that kind of puts uh, their profit priority um, over the fundamental role of housing in life, safety, and welfare. Um, and then I have maybe just like a brief comment on on the upsides. Um, Roberto, I mean, I think you're, you know, you are correct to say that in some cases, you know, uh, the the form of single family rental housing offered by corporate landlords could be beneficial. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, there's a there's a lot of ways in which the the kind of digitally mediated tenant landlord relationship can be convenient, efficient, all of these things. Like I myself pay my rent online, um, submit maintenance requests online. So um, it's not to say that um, you know that it's that it's all bad, right? Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is is like you know what scale of benefit are we talking about here and um, and as David said, for whom, right? And so I think, um, you know, focusing on the benefits to, you know, kind of individual tenants um, can sometimes take our focus away from the kind of the kind of uh, the system level impacts um, that I think are, are really important here. So things like crowding out homeowners, the kind of the, the pace and the, and the scale of rent increases, right? And I think um, those kind of uh, systemic impacts, in my view, sort of wash out some of the, the convenience uh, factor that, that these corporate landlords are offering folks. And so I'll stop there. Um, to give my colleague a chance to respond. Mike? Yeah, boy, where to start? I mean, it's not all good and bad. All of these new models, there's good aspects and there's bad aspects, and there's unintended consequences of, of what's happening. Um, as, <clears throat> as an individual or a family, buying and selling real estate is hard, right? It's just hard. It's hard to buy a home, it's hard to sell a home. So the, the positive upside here is that these new models, funded through venture capital can make it easier for people to buy or sell a home. And, and you can define hard and easy a lot of different ways. One could be it's cheaper, right? Bundle and save, you know? All, all right, that sounds pretty good, right? Um, or easier in terms of taking two transactions, selling my existing home, moving into a new one, into one transaction. That's just, that's just easier. Or you can increase 
liquidity or increase social mobility, make it easier for people to, to move and, and sell if it, if it takes less energy to, to do so. So I think that's the potential, up, I think that's the biggest potential upside all of this. To, I mean, one specific thing, you're talking about regulation, and, and to be frank, I have no idea on regulation. I hope smarter people than me need to look at that and figure out what they want to do. But um, one would be around RESPA, you know? So RESPA is there to prevent, I, I, don't, I don't even know, collusion between brokerage and mortgage and kind of, you know, leading people down a certain path. Uh, right now, that stands in the way of this bundle and save thing. Like literally, if I'm a company and I want to offer someone services to help buy and sell their home and give them a mortgage, and if they do it, I'm gonna give them a rebate at $10,000, that's good for consumers, right? Um, I, I can't do it because of RESPA. So again, someone smarter than me should look at that and figure out, okay, how, how do we get regulations out of the way where we still protect consumers, but it, it makes it easier for these companies that actually want to pass some savings on to consumers to be able to, to, be able to do so. I don't know if I, did you want to weigh in here? Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, Desiree, that response was fantastic. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, there could be models of some of this just to know briefly. Well, one, I mean, Nestor will make comment, and I, I made reference to using Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. And so, you know, updating, extending, just that's why when you get a mortgage, you have to fill out that form with your race and all of that. And it's been, um, it, indispensable of providing transparency, although there's a debate about if you know the extent of the impact on, on practices. Um, then in terms of, um, but I think there's models in other sectors like ride sharing, you know, Chicago has trip level data. They mandated the, the TNC companies to provide them. There's other cities that pursued that and that's opened up transparency into like from a planning point of view, what role that's playing. And there could be an analog here for real estate. And, but then her, you know, I accept responsibility as part of the problem, you know, the evictions, Matt, Matthew Desmond's work, it's all, the government had all that data. There's a giant database in Michigan, the only person ever got, has every eviction, every address, the only person who's figured out how to get it out was me and my team one time. And so, you know, we have a lot of work, that's a court system, government access to information. Um, Paul Waddell and I had a conversation about property data and all the issues around that, which is central to, that's why there's such so little research linking evictions to ownership category, because it's such a pain to, to do that. And Laura Raymond and um, Dan Immerglock in Atlanta did it, and we looked at trying to do it, and I got scared off, because, you know, for, so anyway, so I think you absolutely identified some areas, and I guess my comment is that across the kind of platform space, there might be emerging models where the public and private sectors are renegotiating, you know, kind of, sometimes it's painful, but we're like, well, right, we need some of your data because um, it's, you know, we, we need shared insight into the problems you're creating and solving so that we can have, more, you know, a tailored policy responses. And on, you know, on the Airbnb front, the study I like the most is Rebecca Lewis and others, University of Oregon. They looked across a bunch of jurisdictions in Oregon and they all regulated differently, like the tourism hot spot was like very libertarian and the high price market was like very draconian and like that's very inspiring to me because it shows that there is actually a regular you know place-based appropriate responses it's been a little rough taking time work in progress but I think we can look to models that's slowly emerging and and, and we're gonna need to pioneer them here in this space too I, I have a question for for, for Roberto and, and, and Mike um, you know I, I, I work at allegedly a nonprofit institution, albeit one that has a, a gazillion dollar in, endowment. Um, but Mike, I guess, I, you know, listening to your presentation about how to lose money, I kept thinking about the old Saturday Night Live, First Bank of Change uh, skit, you know, which was, which was how do we make money, we do it in volume. At, at, I mean, at some point, I, I, VC investors are not stupid. They might be foolish, but they're not stupid. How does Compass, an entity like Compass, make money in the long run? And, and Roberto, I guess this re re responds to your point about VC investors don't expect to make money today, but when you look at this stuff, how are people going to make money in five years? Is, is there enough in the transactions? Yeah, and I think that's the point, right? It all comes down to commissions. You, you can't kind of conjure money out of thin air. It's, it, there's, there's, you can make it from a brokerage commission. So consumers, will collectively pay a real estate agent a commission as a share of the sale, and a portion of that will go to Compass. So that's how Compass can make more money. They can, 
they can take more of the commission from real estate agents. Because they, they're losing money get. on each sale, right? Like, this is the first bank of change, right? So, yeah. And in fact, you showed us they lost more money with, 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 with more sales. But you're, if, if they start to flip the, tra the, the, the commission model, Roberto, you're, you're shaking your Actually, yes, as we speak, that's happening. I mean, after the last quarterly report from Compass, basically they realized, okay, our stock is not doing very well. Um, nobody likes us anymore. We're not a cool tech company anymore. We're a publicly traded company. We need to start being profitable. And they're starting now to put a lot of pressure on making more money on the commissions, exactly that point. I mean, the, in a way, the, the money from venture capital that, I love the word that Mike uses, subsidize uh, companies or new projects, finally stopped. And now you're a Wall Street company, you're, you're an adult, and you need to show profitability. And now they're going back to, to exactly that point. But, but, but I think this, the monopoly aspect of the platform business model, so the, the, the platform capitalism book by Nick Snurek was eye-opening to me. That's only one component. It's also about monet, like monetize, taking the data from the mediated transactions in order to innovate on new products and services that then you can offer. So we buy a lot of stuff from Amazon, and they know exactly what um, Amazon basics or white label products to create. They can undercut the other the, uh, the manufacturers whose products are being sold on Amazon. So I think, to me, that's how I look at it, like that, your ecos that Zillow ecosystem, like that's what they're thinking, I think. It's like, um, but as I point out, because housing is the way it is, I think they're stuck in a conventional business model, but they're, they see the dream of having the app store for real estate, but I, I think maybe they're, they're struggling to get there. You know, that to me is w probably what's on their mind, but um, yeah. D Desiree, that, that prompts, I was really struck by your point of, of the, um, kind of the digitalization of, of, of being a landlord and all of the data that I now have about, you know, this, this tenant. And I was trying to think about, um, have you seen an evidence of, of landlords monetizing that data in, in other ways, saying, you know, I now know all of this about, about a group of tenants who, who have these characteristics and, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, so I think um, maybe not as directly um, as you know, as as you kind of frame the question, but I mean, yeah, they're sitting on on huge amounts of data um, at some of the investment forums that I've attended. Um, some of the you know the executives from the larger landlords say like you know we're more like data and logistics companies, right? And they talk about you know. Um, looking at the data to try to understand why is it taking us so long to like change the locks on a house when you know when a new tenant comes in or um, you know why is it that the maintenance uh, requests are are more frequent and more costly um, at you know at properties that are renting for lower rates right and so there's there's ways in which the the amount of data that they're sitting on allows them to kind of run experiments on okay if we make this tweak we can turn the property faster, or you know, we can just equip the the properties that rent for lower rates with fewer amenities um, in order to you know kind of bypass um, you know all of those maintenance costs that the you know that those properties are are generating, right? Or um, you know, we might find out that in fact people are willing to pay pet rent every month and so forth. Um, so I think um, it's about, yeah, like the, you know, the data is is maybe not being directly monetized um, so much as it is being used to, you know, to basically to, you know, to kind of smooth out any any kind of friction to, to really maximize efficiency, flow, turnover, um, and yeah, to kind of like, you know, basically kind of have as, as friction-free an experience as possible when in fact we know, of course, that housing is, uh, you know, not a free, you know, but that like buying and selling, owning and operating housing um, is, is, you know, can't be a friction free experience. Um, and, you know, I think the question is, you know, should it be? Um, and I think, you know, I would I would argue that, you know, that there are some necessary frictions in the system, um, you know, that we, you know, that we look to to housing, you know, to kind of play a huge role in our economy. Um, and I think we haven't really thought through the long range consequences of kind of opening it up to this like very rapid turnover um, and kind of uh, frictionlessness. Yeah. Let me give the audience uh, a chance. Um, Ivan. 
great, great presentations and responses, and we got some modular in too, so I appreciate that. Um, but maybe stepping back, I'm, as somebody who's kind of an immigrant to this country, I'm always shocked by how much structural bias towards multifamily housing, as, to, as opposed to any place I've ever been, uh, exists in the US, and often it's attributed to the market. My perspective is it's also built into the regulatory framework. Um, and then it was interesting to see after the, the crisis, immediately after the crisis, the numbers in multifamily going up faster than single family for maybe the first time in the history or last, last 50 years. Are these trends um, going to impact that growth? They, uh, is this is single, and is it gonna prevent the p potential for things that are happening in Berkeley, like uh, you know eliminating exclusionary single family zoning or Minneapolis, those two cities have been trying to increase appropriate scaled multifamily solutions, owner occupied. Is this trend um, and a consolidation of this trend going to stop that trend, or is it a reflection of the trap of that trend? And this is more of a intuitive than a research question. And how are those changing? Because there was there was clearly a for me a silver lining in the cultural acceptance of multifamily housing that I'd not seen in this country in my experience for 30 years. I mean, I'm also an immigrant, so it's hard to tell. What I'm surprised to see is this fascinate, fascination in the US of owning a house. If you can, a single family house, yes, no, no condo. I mean, I, I moved to San Francisco, I live in San Francisco, and if you're cool, you have to live in a single home. Like nobody moves to an apartment, nobody wants to move there. It's so strange. I mean, it's so strange that you have to own. If you look at Sweden and other countries, a percentage of home ownership is 50% or even less sometimes in some countries. So um, my particular dream would be that more things like Berkeley happened where you can't build single homes anymore, and, and that starts happening in many other parts, and that we realize that it's more important to live in a building because it's greener than living in single homes. Um, that, Yes. Sorry, as, as an example, it just kind of makes, so how is that a market condition, and how is that not a structural? Yeah. No, no, that, that, that was, that's my point. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, it's, um, hopefully that's something that newer generations are starting to think. I got very excited and started investing early on on co-living, because it was a new way of using real estate in a more dense way. Unfortunately, the pandemic killed the industry. Basically, it disseminated completely. But I hope that new models like co-living and other models are starting to come into the market so that we can change the relationship that we have to ownership, which I think is very strange, and multifamily, you know, or living in buildings, which I think is so important. Fortunately, we have a correspondent in, in, in Berkeley at the moment. <laughs> And, and Desiree, I, I saw you nodding your head uh, at one point in there, so I, I didn't know if you wanted to, to weigh in on, on this particular question. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's there's sort of contradictory things happening. I mean, I yeah, housing politics in Berkeley are uh, a, a, a special thing. Um, I think um, on you know on the kind of the the structural bias against uh, multifamily um, and you know the the possibility of expanding multifamily development. Um, I think one thing to note is that. Um, you know, in the in the kind of the institutional investor space, um, in in the single family market, I mean, there's this kind of um, like so much cash has poured into this asset class in the past couple of years, that um, you know that I think I would guess I have I have my I have my doubts about the ability to kind of deploy all this capital, right? Because I think like we all know that you know that supply is limited right now, and that's kind of a hangover from from 2008, right? So. We know that we, you know, that we didn't kind of like ramp up single family production after 2008, um, perhaps because, you know, multifamily development was, was more on the rise. Um, so there's this kind of hunt for inventory. Um, and so one of the, you know, one of the developments to come out of this dwindling single family um, inventory is that we're seeing the kind of the rise of build for rent, right? Which is, you know, kind of institutional investors going further up the chain in order to acquire land, to develop it. They're getting into partnerships with builders. Builders like Lennar are rolling out their own single family rental companies. Um, there's all kinds of things happening in the build for rent space. And, and my concern is that rather than 
kind of encouraging people to live more densely, more sustainably. Um, what we're seeing, in fact, is that, you know, the creation of these, you know, entire rental communities um, that are really kind of like doubling down on unsustainable development rather than, you know, going in the other direction. And in part, probably because of, you know, some of the, you know, the politics, um, the kind of anti-development and particularly like anti-dense, uh, you know, anti-density uh, politics um, that, you know, that play out in places that are already developed. So, um, yeah, and I, but I think so, the, and then so the contradictory part of this is like, the, you know, the pandemic with all of us kind of spending more and more time at home, um, I think people actually like crave connection and interaction with neighbors and all these things, all of these things that are actually like quite hard to, to get um, in single family homes. Um, and so, you know, I, yeah, like people want more space because they're at home all the time, but also like everyone's sitting in their, like in their homes um, and not really interacting with people. And so I'm wondering if the pendulum will kind of swing the other way and people will begin to, you know, to be drawn back toward multifamily, um, whether it's rental or, you know, kind of condo or co-op ownership um, as a way to kind of find that social connection again, um, if and when we ever come out of this pandemic. David, I know I've probably spoken more than my share, but I, oh, I just can't resist this guess in terms of zoning, in terms of comparing the mortgage interest tax deduction versus the rental assistance. We definitely prioritize single family homes. Well, why is that? Well, obviously we have deep cultural bias and I think it goes back to, it's really a Victorian Protestant thing. Robert Fishman's bourgeois utopias describes wonderfully the origins of this. And when we start building more and more single family homes in the early 20th century, often it's accompanied by the adoption of zoning and several cities had explicitly racial zoning. So, so the ideology of single family home ownership is intertwined with race. And then when 19, um, the racial zoning the Supreme Court throws out, you switch and start losing racially restrictive covenants, especially in single family neighborhoods. So I've been doing a deep dive in Ann Arbor, bunch of projects around the country starting about 1912. Shelley versus Kramer isn't until 1948. So 10% of all of the um, single family homes roughly in Ann Arbor have these. And so, okay, so how do you, so you're talking about fair housing today, right? You know, the, uh, so we, you have to untangle all of this. And so, you know, I'm in, involved in this community-based project with the local black community. They have a historical museum. And we're trying to wreck it. The memories are alive. And we're trying to you know, create conversations and dialogue. Because sure, yeah, everyone wants the whiz bang. Let's abolish single family zoning today. But I think we got to get a little bit deeper. So yeah, um, thanks for pointing out the water we're all swimming in. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I, somebody went out on the way here. Somebody's like, are you going to talk about that project? I was like, I don't know. You know so I, I just did. There, <laughs> there we go. go. Um, Chris, do we have anything? Uh, uh, yeah, one question from our, our, our Zoom audience, or our, our Vimeo audience. Um, we, in talking about, David, your question about what the policy response we want to pursue, you know, Desiree provided a great list, mostly focused on tenants. Uh, the, the question is, is well, how do we address the, the power disparities between investors and home buyers? It seems like home buyers in much of this conversation are the ones who are being beat out. I guess part of this question for Mike, you talked about power buyers. Is there any potential benefit there? Are, there, are, they, are they actually helping you in this disparity or are they just finding a way to make a buck? At, uh, and I no, guess they, Desiree, to throw it back to you too, do you have anything to add to your list for uh, home buyers? They, they, they are helping. So it, it's interesting that you know, power buyers are, are funded by venture capitalists and Wall Street. So Wall Street is solving a problem created by Wall Street. So great, that's that's fine. I mean, I think if you're talking about, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up home buyers because they, they are the, I think the disadvantaged parties here, right? If you're, if I'm looking to buy a home and I'm competing against cashed up Wall Street investors with billions of dollars, and their job is to buy homes, who, who do you think is going to win more often than not? I'm, I'm, I just can't compete with them. Maybe I can't do a cash offer. Maybe I can't offer as much. Um, there's, there's all the emotional considerations involved in buying and selling a home that individuals and families have that corporations don't have. Think about school districts and, and starting school in the fall. Like you have to move at a certain time, right? Or I want to be, I want to live near my parents so that my kids can see their grandparents. Corporations don't think about that, right? It's just an Excel spreadsheet for them, da, 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 and, and there you go. So there, there's two, yeah, there's two very different things. I think, you know, power buyers can help level the playing field in terms of cash offers, 
but they, there's nothing out there that can help level the playing field in terms of what you can offer. So, you know, an institutional investor, which again is different than an investor, right? Most investors are mom and pop landlords, right? But then you have some that are institutional investors, which are the, you know, American Homes for Rent, Invitation Homes. Those companies know they're going to hold, I mean, all investors, I guess, but um, they know they're going to hold on to a home for five, seven, ten years. They're not flipping it in 60 days. So they don't care what they pay. They can pay over 5, 10, 15, 20 percent over asking price. How do, you, how do you compete with that? So I, I realize I'm just giving questions. There's no answers. Do you have an answer? But, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is there. If, if it's Car Carol and, and, and then Desiree and, and um, Chris, I didn't do any better at staying on time than you did. <laughs> I, I, I would just, uh, I, I just need to intersect here. There's this um, conversation going on as if home ownership in a single family home is a God-given right. And the fact is, it's essentially a government-given right to white people. Okay, so one of the concerns I have is, you know, who's being hurt by this corporate landlord? Um, maybe it's people who want to buy a home in an exclusively white school district, um, you know, and care about the school district. And maybe it's not. Maybe it, it maybe that home through the corporate landlord um, now has the possibility to go to someone who cannot afford to buy that home. They don't have the generational wealth for the down payment. Um, and I mean, this is this is a very real topic that as we talk about single family home rental, and I agree with all of um, Desiree's policy constructs, um, except for putting a greater value on home ownership of single family homes than rental. Um, and, uh, you know, I, that is just something I think we really need to think deeply about. Last comment I want to make, or, uh, yeah, I guess it's a comment, is when we talk about regulation here, the one thing we haven't really talked about, uh, we've talked about kind of regulating, you know, for tenant protections, regulating um, market share for the landlord. I really think we need to talk about regulating the venture capital. We need to talk about regulating where the money goes. If some of that venture capital went to entities, you know, that were buying those homes um, to keep them affordable for a long period of time, you know, like with, with restrictions, things like that. It's like, how do you regulate the capital and what it is allowed to do? Desiree, I want to give you, I, since that question was originally posed uh, to you, the last word, sure. as it were. Yeah, um, no, I think all great points. And I think uh, the only thing that I would add is that, um, of course, like what happens to renters and what happens to owners is related, right? So, um, you know, this this power buying thing, I mean, okay, you know, maybe that helped people compete in terms of the ability to make an all cash offer, um, but it doesn't do any, you know, it doesn't really make any impact on, on market dynamics other than that, right? So it's not going to intervene to like, you know, uh, bring prices down, which of course is another another problem that, that we're facing right now. Prices have appreciated so much that it's difficult for people to get a down payment, um, much less an all cash offer. So I think, you know, um, things like intervening in the market share um, of institutional owners, broad-based tenant protections, those those make markets less attractive to landlords, uh, like, you know, like invitation homes or American homes for rent, um, which might help take some of the pressure, the uh, like kind of the, the competition, it might make the competition between owners and institutional actors a little less heated, right, if the markets become less attractive to institutional players. Um, and equally, you know, the reason people, one of the reasons why we are so attracted to home ownership is because it's not that great to be a tenant in this country, right? So places where uh, countries that have, um, uh, you know, a different mix of owners versus renters usually also have more tenant-friendly policies. And so it is it is more feasible to be a tenant in those places, right? So like people want to become owners not only because of the kind of, you know, the mythos of the American dream, um, but also because you can control your housing costs for 30 years. And, you know, like you can't really do that as a, as a tenant. Um, 
so um so i think you know kind of yes to all the things that was that carol um just mentioned but also just to note that um that there is an interaction between uh you know kind of uh tenants and owners in terms of you know like regulations and policies that are that are directed at the at the rental market um can also have an impact on on homeowners and vice versa so you're gonna make make an exception to what i just said because sean sean donovan was has something he, he de eagerly wants to say. Yeah. So just one thing we haven't brought up that we should remember here is that there is a giant power seller in this market, which is the U.S. government. We, the U.S. government controls so much of the mortgage market through Fannie, Freddie, FHA, that that is an important lever for policy here as well. And it's actually something Carol did in the Obama administration, which was to change the way we did loan sales to put mission criteria into those sales. So there's a there's a whole set of policies, I think, there, too, that are worth mentioning before we leave this. Well, uh, Chris, you can add that to the um, next panel, which uh, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, we will be back at 2.15, um, and we'll be talking about digitalization and changes in the search uh, and and finance from the, from the sort of mortgage side of, of, of the market. It was not part of uh, what we originally thought about, but it is now. Um, you know, as Roberta said, we started, we started having a conversation several years ago uh, about this, and, and um, you really spurred some of my interest in this. I'm just so uh, thrilled that we, um, in the course of this journey, came, up, came across uh, De Desiree and, and Mike. Robert and I actually knew each other in a previous life. Um, and I saw something that he was doing that, that caused me to reach out and, and start a conversation. Um, just thank you for a terrific presentation and, and thank you for the terrific work that you're doing in, in this field because I think we've underscored how important these are. So uh, with that, let's take a break and uh, see you back at 2.15. Thank you.